Here we're going to look at two problems from the Mongolian Math Olympiad. So the first one is from the year 2000 exam and it is question four. And the second one is from the year 2007 exam and it's actually from the teacher's version of the exam. So I think this is really interesting. Not a ton of countries do it, but some countries have a, an exam for students and an exam for teachers. So here we're looking at a problem from the student's exam and a problem from the teacher's exam. Okay, so let's maybe go ahead and look at the statements of the, these problems. I'll give you guys some hints and then we'll look at the solution. So for the first question, we want to suppose that we have f, which is a function from r to r, and it satisfies two conditions. So the first one is an inequality, so we have the absolute value of a minus b is bigger than or equal to the absolute value of f of a minus f of b. So if you're familiar with real analysis, this is some sort of Lipschitz condition, and this implies continuity, but we're not gonna use anything about continuity of this function or anything like that, because I think it's kind of beyond the scope of the simplest possible solution. The second thing we know about the function is that if we apply f three times to zero, so in other words, we have f of f of f of zero, we get zero. And then our goal is to show that f of zero equals zero. Okay, so a hint for this problem is to continually apply f to something and then create some long string of inequalities that maybe gives you some information. And you're gonna finish this off with two different cases. Okay, so let's look at the second one. So we wanna suppose that we have natural numbers x, y, and z. So by natural numbers, I mean positive integers. And they satisfy this equation, x times y equals z squared plus one. And what we wanna show is that there exist a, b, c, and d, which are integers, satisfying these equations. So x is equal to a squared plus b squared, y is equal to c squared plus d squared, and z is ac plus bd. So what this is getting at is that if x, y, and z satisfy this, then x is a sum of squares, y is a sum of squares, and then z is a combination of the components that are building x and y as sums of squares. So I've got a whole video on sums of squares from when I taught a number theory class if you guys want to try to find that. My hint for this problem is to work over the Gaussian integers and in fact use the fact that we have prime factorization in the Gaussian integers. So I think this is like an appropriate strategy for this problem because this is from the teacher's exam and this actually makes the problem not super hard and I think the idea with the teacher's exam is that it's not that the problems are super hard or even harder than the student's exam. In some cases I think they're probably easier but I think maybe more higher mathematics techniques are applicable given that teachers have been exposed to higher mathematical techniques. Okay, so maybe give these problems a go with this, these hints and we'll come back with a solution. Okay, now we're ready to jump into a solution starting with this first one. So I wanna start with kind of our goal, which is um, f of zero, but I'm gonna call it absolute value of f of zero because that's gonna allow me to use this inequality over and over again. So now I'm gonna rewrite this as the absolute value of f of zero minus zero. So that's pretty trivial. Now I will apply this inequality. So I'm going to apply f to this term and to this, this term. And then we'll get something that is less than or equal to this. So in other words, this is bigger than or equal to f composed with f of 0 minus f of 0, like that. Good. Now I'm going to do that again. So let's see what we get there. So if I apply f to this thing right here, I'm going to get f composed with f composed with f. In other words, I'm gonna get zero because of my second rule. So I'm just gonna write this as zero minus f composed with f of zero. So we've got something like that. Great, now I'm gonna go ahead and bring that down. So this is gonna be equal to the absolute value of f of f of zero. Then I'm gonna add a minus zero, but to the other side. Now let's apply f one more time. So let's see what that gives us. 
So we will have an inequality, so this is gonna be bigger than or equal to. Applying f to this, we have this threefold application of our function to zero, but again, that's gonna be equal to zero by our second tool. So we have this is gonna be zero minus f of zero. But notice that's absolute value of f of zero. So let's see what we've got going on. So we've got the extreme left-hand side of this inequality is the absolute value of f of zero. The extreme right-hand side of this inequality is also the absolute value of f of zero. And then in the middle, we have two interesting things. So the first interesting thing, which I'll rewrite here without the minus zero is f composed with itself evaluated at zero. So, and then the second interesting thing is this thing right here, this f of f of zero minus f of zero. So now since the extreme left and right hand side of this inequality are in fact equal to each other, that means everything in the middle is also equal. In particular, this guy and this guy are equal to each other and f of zero. So let's maybe go ahead and write that down. So we have these following two facts. We have absolute value of f of zero equals absolute value of f composed with f of zero. So that's from this yellow and this pink. And then we also have absolute value of f of zero equals absolute value of f of f of zero minus f of zero. So that would be like this yellow and this pink. Okay, great. So now let's see what we can do with this. So if two things are equal in absolute value, that means they're equal to plus or minus each other. So what this tells us is that f of f of zero equals plus minus f of zero, like that. And then likewise, this one tells us that um, f of f of zero minus f of zero equals plus minus f of zero. But those pluses and minuses are independent of each other, so we have to be careful about that. So maybe I'll underline this one in purple and maybe this one in orange so that we can keep a handle on which one that we're working with. So let's maybe look at our first case. So case number one, comes from this purple equation, and we'll take the positive value of this purple equation. So we've got f of f of zero equals f of zero. The next what I wanna do is apply f to both sides of this equation. So let's just put an f over it to say we're applying f. And notice on the left-hand side, we'll get a three-fold application of f to zero, but that's equal to zero. Then on the right-hand side, we have f of f of zero, but that's just equal to f of zero by our assumption from this case. So now looking at this left and right-hand side of this equation, we see that we're done. Okay, great. So now let's look at case two, which is built off of, again, this purple boxed equation, but with the minus sign. So we have f of f of zero equals minus f of zero. Now, we can't really apply f to both sides of this because we don't have any information of whether or not f is an even function. So what we'll do instead is plug this assumption into the orange boxed equation up there, and let's see what that gives us. So I'll replace f of f of zero with minus f of zero. So the left-hand side of the equation will be minus two f of zero, and the right-hand side of the equation will be plus minus f of zero. Again, because I made this replacement right here. Okay, nice. But now notice that the only way for this equation to hold is for f of zero to be equal to zero. So you can break this up into cases, but I don't think that's super necessary. What it amounts to is you have three f of zero equals zero or f of zero equals zero. Immediately, both of them uh, bring you to the right spot. So here we have f of zero equals zero, which is what we wanted to show for this first problem. Okay, let's get rid of this and then we'll look at a solution to the second problem.
Okay, now we're ready to look at this solution to the teacher's problem. So first off, I wanna take this z squared plus one and then factor it over the Gaussian integers. So maybe first I'll recall what the Gaussian integers are. So z adjoin i, those are gonna be all numbers of the form m plus n times i, where m and n are integers. And this enjoys a lot of the characteristics of the regular integers. In fact, you can factor things into primes in the Gaussian integers. And not all primes in the integers are primes in the Gaussian integers. For example, the number five factors like uh, two plus i, two minus i. So that's kind of interesting. So let's take this z squared plus one and we can factor it like z plus i times z minus i. Now we're gonna take each of these and factor them into Gaussian primes. So I'll color code this one with pink parentheses and then this one with peach colored parentheses. So let's say the factorization of z plus i is p1 plus q1 times i all the way up to pk plus qk times i. Good. So again, that's the factorization of z plus i. And now let's have a similar factorization of z minus i. So if we take a similar factorization of z minus i, we'll notice that since z plus i and z minus i are complex conjugates of each other, the Gaussian prime factorization of z minus i must include complex conjugates of the same primes from the factorization of z plus i. So we have p1 minus q1i all the way up to pk minus qk times i like this. Now we run into the next question, and that next question is, how do we know that we don't have a regular prime out here? What I mean by a regular prime, or maybe a product of regular primes, I mean primes in the integers. So let's maybe talk our way through that. So notice, if we had a regular prime out there, in other words, a prime inside the integers, then that would not allow for a coefficient of one in front of this i and a coefficient of negative one in front of that i. Because this coefficient would be some multiple of something that's happening in here, and this coefficient would also be some multiple of something that's happening in there. So we don't have any products of regular primes out front. Okay, great. And then using our setup, we know that z squared plus one is equal to x times y. That means we know that this is also equal to x times y. Okay, now next what we wanna do is notice that x and y have their own factorization into primes and Gaussian primes. And in fact, since x and y are both integers, in fact, they're natural numbers, we know that their factorization into Gaussian primes will be factorization um, with complex conjugates. So let's maybe go ahead and point out what is going on here. So let's say maybe I'll put blue parentheses around the X. That means for instance, if this guy right here is a factor of X, then it's, its complex conjugate also has to be a factor of X. And every term inside of these pink parentheses that's a factor of x, its corresponding complex conjugate, conjugate also has to be a factor of x. And then likewise, if we think about the y as being everything in purple parentheses, if something in here is a Gaussian prime factor of y, then its corresponding complex conjugate also has to be a Gaussian prime factor of y. So what that boils down to is we can mash all of the Gaussian prime factors together and then all of the complex conjugates of those Gaussian prime factors together into a nice factorization of x as a plus bi times a minus bi. Great, where for instance, maybe this p1 plus q1i is used to build a plus bi, 
or all of the parts from X that are from these pink parentheses build A plus B I, and then all of the parts from these peach parentheses are building A minus B I. Good, and then likewise, we'll have a similar way to construct Y. So we'll take all of the parts from Y from these pink parentheses and form C plus D I, and then all of the parts from these peach parentheses and form C minus D I. And so just to reiterate, this is my construction of X and my construction of Y. But now notice that tells us that X equals a plus bi times a minus bi, but now multiplying that out, we get a squared plus b squared, which is exactly what we wanted. And then similarly, if we look at y, that's gonna be c plus di times c minus di, but that'll be equal to c squared plus d squared. But now let's put, look back at how we constructed this from the parts of z squared plus one or z plus i times z minus i. So notice all of the z plus i terms went here or here, and all of the z minus i terms went here or here. So what that tells us is that z plus i is equal to a plus b i times c plus d i. So we can write that down. So z plus i is equal to a plus b i times c plus d i. But now we can multiply this out and compare real and imaginary parts on each side. So notice the real part will be AC minus BD. And then the imaginary part will be AD plus BC. So it will be plus I times AD plus BC. So that tells us two things immediately. That tells us that Z is equal to AC minus BD, and that tells us that one is equal to AD plus BC. Now this may seem like a problem because our goal was for Z to equal AC plus BD, but we can just rename B if we wanted to. We could rename this as AC plus negative B times D, and all of these equations still hold because we can also rewrite this as a plus negative b squared. So that shows that if x, y, and z satisfy this equation, there have to be integers a, b, c, and d making this true. And that's a good place to stop.